First of all, thank you very much for the invitation, Professor Priolo, to be back here in Catania in this special school. So, um, a lot has been said already, but I would like to sort of bring things together and just make you follow a journey. And uh, the journey, which is the journey of us too, not having solutions, by far not, for the title I have given. And in the audience, there are many people who are competent in various areas. I also was told that there are a number of uh, non strictly scientists, is that correct? So they also, I have ins I'm insisting on concepts also, because that's also something which is very important for a scientist too, to know what concepts the science with one is performing is based on. So we are here at the university and at the school, of course, and uh, my lecture deals with steps towards life just steps and the beginning steps. Of course, it had been in the works for many years, hundreds of years, people have worried about what's his life, but uh, just a few steps and putting them in another context. And the fact that chemistry has really to do a lot with these steps, which led to the emergence of life. But we have to start a long time ago, here. 13.7 billion years ago, there was a big bang and our universe was born. Very quickly, it was born and then it was very hot. No chemistry, energy. Then it cooled down progressively, particles formed and these particles then made more aggregates. This was the age of physics at the beginning. No chemistry. When it was cold enough to form atoms, which could get together to make molecules. Then about here, chemistry started. Then came the age of chemistry. Molecules became more and more complex. They began to sit together to make aggregates, eventually to make sort of a small uh, cages, small uh, uh, lipids and uh, units which could encase something sort of like a primitive cell and then out of this complex chemistry a new property appeared which is life on our planet Earth that's the age of biology. On our planet at least things continue to evolve and generating another property of great importance which beyond the steps of life is thinking. This thinking is represented by this statue you see here of Rodin, Auguste Rodin, the thinker. Very famous statue, probably most of you have seen it. So life led also then eventually to the emergence of thinking. Before I continue, let me just point out one thing. Here is the end of the screen, but it's not the end of the evolution of the universe. We, as we are sitting here, are a point in space and a point in time. There are many other things in the universe. It will continue to evolve. And there are now people thinking that can stop evolutions. This is totally impossible. The universe is continuing to evolve by its own structure, the way it is built, and it will continue and continue and continue. And we cannot do much. We cannot do anything about that. But as we will see towards the end, we can do something about ourselves. Then the question which comes up is, what do we know about the universe? This is not a bad slide. This is intentionally made like that. Because physicists tell us that 68% of dark energy, 27% of dark matter, 95% of darkness. We don't know anything about that, at least. But we are not interested in that thing. There's 5% of visible matter. That is, we are part of that. And that is, as I like to say, the matter that matters. <laughs> That's the matter we have to matter about. So if you want to have a parameter to measure how things have evolved, we can look at, let's say, complexity of the object or the amount of information present in that object. And we start with divided matter. 
which then can become condensed, things getting together, atoms making molecules, then organized in some ways, then living, thinking, and maybe something else. It's very difficult to think beyond our own thinking, but we cannot exclude that there can be something more complex than what we know as being thinking. And of course, you have already understood from what I think myself, is that this property is the most advanced property on our planet. That's why we are here, in fact. So, the evolution of matter, it looks like a little bit there's a pressure somewhere of getting more and more complex, some places, in some places, not everywhere. Otherwise, of course, there will be questions about entropy and so on. And this is the way towards more and more complex forms of matter as a function of time. So then a question comes up, a very big question. What is this big question? Which, the question which, as I see you show here, it's a very big one. How does matter become complex? How can one go from an elementary particle to a thinking organism? And maybe the even higher forms, higher complexities in matter. To try to answer, this is the question which sort of was underlying probably the mind of everybody thinking about the world, the universe, and so on. And then mankind invented something, created something, which is called science. Let's consider just three pillars of science. Physics deals with the laws of the universe on which everything depends. Biology deals with the rules of life. These are not laws, they are rules, which are a result of these laws. How it functions, how living systems function. So what is chemistry doing? I guess you may have already seen an answer to that. Chemistry tries to beat the bridge. The idea is, how can you go from general laws to specific expressions of these laws, like a living organism? How do you go from general rules? the laws of physics, to living organisms on a planet called Earth. And this is, of course, very, very important because we know that general relativity is a very important theory for explaining many things, or quantum mechanics. But first you have to have an Einstein, you have to have a Planck. So generating the entity capable of doing this, of understanding, the laws of the universe is, of course, the first step. You have to know how this can happen. And this is a problem which deals with chemistry trying to build the bridge between the two. The answer to the question is, it's not an answer, so to say, it's a word. It just means that it has happened by self-organization, which means it has happened on the basis of the way in which our universe is constructed. Our universe has a structure that in some places things will organize. And of course, one can even claim that is a cosmic imperative, that our universe is constructed in such a way that it will generate organization somewhere so that life for me, and not just for me, for a number of other people, is not an accident. It is a result of the way our universe is structured. So this self-organization, however, for the moment, there are still difficulties in understanding it in a unitary way, so that on the cosmic level, on the grand scale, the universe, as cosmologists tell us, has got a structure by the action of gravitational forces on the in homogeneities, in density, and in rates of expansion at very early times after the Big Bang. This is, of course, cosmic. But our matter, the problem we are interested in as human beings, is how does complex matter, molecular matter, organize? One can say that it happens by combinations between the elements present in the universe, linked together through electromagnetic forces, and this is sort of a random process where you generate different objects and some are, so to say, better thermodynamically 
than others and then progress towards more and more organized structures. This means also that before there was the famous biological Darwinian evolution, there was certainly an evolution which had nothing to do with the biological one, which is of much broader significance than the Darwinian one, because it is very hard to imagine that you will jump into life from a particle. There must have been forces, there must have been ways in which things have become stepwise more and more complex until reaching the threshold where this property called, called life appeared. A property which someday we will just reproduce. But at the moment, we have still to work on it and still try to understand. So it's a generalization of the Darwinian evolution. And I would even say self-organization is the general, let's say, the, the, the general aspect, the general concept behind. And Darwinian evolution is just a subgroup of that. So chemistry in this era, in this science which mankind has set up progressively, is a science which deals with the structure of matter, how it is built, and the transformation of matter. How can you convert given entities making up matter into other ones? What can you do? How can you do that? How can you convert objects into one another? In fact, I am a chemist because of that. Because when you realize that a chemist has the ability to transform material objects from one type into another type, then it's a sort of, I would say, quite a Promethean feeling. Huh? And I will come back to that. Now, let's look a little bit at some history. 2,500 years ago, in a small country not so far away, we had people, like in others before, probably also in other places, thinking about how the, all, all these things are built up, how, what are the constituents. There was Empedocles. In fact, there is, uh, Empedocles has something to do with Sicily huh, also. There is somewhere a place uh, called Porto Empedocle, no? <laughs> so um, he proposed that uh, matter was made of four elements, fire, air, water, earth. And the combination of elements give properties. Dry, earth is fire, fire and earth. Air is hot, air and water is humid, water and earth is cold. It's a start. Of course, it was quite primitive in some ways, but OK, it's a start. At about the same time, however, somebody had a much deeper insight. And of course, you can guess it was Democritus. Democritus said that matter is made of particles which you cannot make smaller, a pomos, uh, which we now call atoms. And uh, this, of course, is something which is, we now know is true, that matter is made of these particles. Then the question is, however, if you propose an idea, science requires that you prove the correctness of that idea. There is, however, a simple way to convince people in the street that matter is particulate. And it's a very simple experiment, I think, which is difficult to escape. Conclusions are difficult to escape. Take a glass of water, take a piece of sugar, put it in, it dissolves. If matter were continuous, it could not dissolve, obviously. So things which make up the piece of sugar, things which make up the glass of water, they have space between, so they can mix together. And I guess uh, you cannot escape the conclusion that uh, matter must be particulate. Now, I cannot, of course, resist citing somebody else very important, obviously, close to here. There was this famous scientist, Archimedes. I'm not going to give you a lecture on the history of science. It's not my field. But I just I needed to cite him, of course, because he was a really a great, great person, a great scientist. However, uh, as things progressed, as one was finding more and more of these things called elements, which one could separate, isolate, characterize, it looked very chaotic, not much order in all that. Until in the middle of the 19th century, a number of people, but one more than the others, had a deeper insight, came up with the fact that these 
elements one had been categorizing in fact could be put in an order. And this is, had an order, had a, a sequence can be arranged in a regular way. And this was due to Dmitry Mendeleev. Dmitry Mendeleev in 1869 published what I consider as one of the most important papers in science ever published, which is this one in 1869 in Zeitschrift für Chemie. It's a German paper, the title is in German, um, über die Beziehung der Eigenschaften zu den Atomgewichten der Elemente. At that time, chemistry was much practiced, of course, in German. That's the translation into English. And what Mendeleev had seen is that you can put an order into these elements which had been found, putting them in columns and in rows, and organizing them in that way. That was fantastic progress. Even so, he was courageous enough to say that there are places where I have to put a, push, a question mark because we don't know what is here, but there should be something. And of course, these elements have been found later. So this is really a fantastic step in knowledge, in science for mankind. This table now is, of course, known as the periodic table of the elements. And this is the way it looks now. That's just a picture, but it sort of gives just the list of the elements classified following Mendeleev's initial principles. And what is fantastic here is that these are the bricks of visible matter. If you look at this, you have before your eyes the bricks which make up all visible matter everywhere in the universe. This is for me something absolutely, I mean, not just astonishing, it's unbelievable almost, that we can have through, in front of our eyes, the table which tells us that anything, any visible matter, anywhere is made of this. Why is it? You can say, okay, how do you know? It's nothing special. It's just that, like counting, one, two, three, four, five. One proton, one electron, two protons, two electrons, and so on. You just count. And there's nothing between two and three, three and four, four and five. So the table is full. It's complete. That also implies that the connections between these things is also constant. Of course, depending on conditions, a given connection may exist or not. Temperature and so on. But the connections between what chemists call the bond and the nature of these elements they are constant to the universe. So, uh, one can say also, if in the morning you wake up and say, my experiments haven't worked, terrible, you look at the table and say, oh, we have done something. We have been able, mankind has been able to generate a table which shows you the constitution of visible matter in the universe. And that is the playground of chemistry. Chemists are like children playing with Lego, the Lego pieces are these elements, and with this you build, you build, you build. And that is the fantastic power of chemistry to rearrange the whole thing and to make new entities out of the different combinations. Now, the, way it's, the, the, the constitution is one thing, but how can you convert a given set into another set? For that you need an idea about uh, a, a basic notion of what happens in the process. And as uh, Lavoisier had ri has written, nothing is lost, nothing is created, everything is transformed. And these chemists know that very well. That's the basis of the chemical reaction equation. When you mix some, ob some chemical objects, they can react, they can transform themselves, but the pieces they're made of are conserved in the process. This is the basis of the chemical reaction. However, this is not enough. We know the composition, but is there a linkage between these different bricks, these different elements? So again, around the, 19, the 1860s, various people have become aware of, of course, that there are linkages between these elements, these atoms. And so one came up with a number of representations of this. 
This is a representation given by Burtz. This is a representation given by Kikuli in Germany, Burtz in France, Kikuli in Germany. They're not wrong, but they're a bit, uh, a bit far away from what we use now. An Austrian physical chemist, Lo Schmidt, proposed this kind of representation, which was very forward-looking, because, as you see here, if you use as big circle a carbon atom, a small circle a hydrogen atom, you get exactly the right structure now, the way we write it. And for instance, the second of those, ethyl alcohol, is this, as we write it now. Now we give, we write down by a symbol the atom which is linked to another one, uh, but this was basically correct. So, we are now at the stage of connectivity. But connectivity took, it took some time to be accepted. It took some time to have, be, to have molecule, the notion of molecules accepted. And um, here's something coming back again to Sicily. In uh, 1860, there was the first, probably the first real scientific congress, which was a chemical congress, which was held in Karlsruhe in Germany, 1860, organized by three people, Fürz in France, Kikuli in Germany, and somebody, a professor from Karlsruhe, who is not so known. And the reason why this was organized is that um, Wirtz and uh, Kikuli have said, look, we don't know what we are doing. We have 19 ways of writing acetic acid. Something must be wrong. We have to, get, we have to know what's going on. So the, that Congress was convened to try to make some sense out of this theory of representation. And there was there one person who had a very deep insight. That was Kanizaro. For chemists, the Kanizaro reaction is well known. But that is not the most important. The most important were his lectures given in Genoa, where he, when you look at up, the guy had seen what was going on. And there was a famous German chemist, I don't remember his name, I think it was Lothar Meyer, perhaps, who, when, uh, as he was going back to his home place, to his city, he said, suddenly the scales fell from my eyes, and I saw that that was correct. So this was really a fantastic contribution to uh, understanding what molecules are. Incidentally, Mendeleev was also there, and also Borodin. And Borodin, what do you know of Borodin? Opera, of course. But Borodin considered himself first a chemist. And he said, I compose on the weekends. <laughs> So, now, we now, at this stage, know more or less what molecules are. But are they just a connection between elements? No. In 1874, independently, two chemists proposed that molecules had a shape, an architecture. This was Van Toff in uh, Holland, in the Netherlands, and Lebel in France. They published in 1874 independent papers saying that molecules have a shape, they have an architecture. They are not just uh, connections, not, not just a graph. They have a shape. And that is, of course, uh, the start of stereochemistry. Von Toff did many other things. In fact, he got the first Nobel Prize but for the Von Toff's laws in physical chemistry. Lebel was a very good chemist. He did that very important work. But uh, not so much else, although he was a student also. He worked with Wurz at some stage. Now, of course, speaking about steps of life, one cannot um, avoid citing Le Pasteur, because Pasteur was uh, the first one to understand what a major characteristic of biological type of molecules, where he said that some molecules are like a left hand and some like a right hand. Hand in Greek is kairos, so they are molecular chirality. Molecules looking like left hands or like right hands. So I could, of course, cite many, many more people. I have just a small selection. You could speak months on the history of science and the history of chemistry, obviously. But let's just now sort of go to the step where 
from the atom to the molecules, we realize that molecular chemistry has been built up. And this molecular chemistry is built on the fact that you can link the bricks, the elements, by strong bonds, strong connections, which chemists call covalent bonds. And, pardon, and this organization then is, has developed over the years. If I want just to cite two milestones in this molecular chemistry, the first one is in 1828, the synthesis for the non-chemist. Synthesis for a chemist means the setting up of a given edifice, a given construction of molecular construction by putting the right atoms in the right connections together. He made urea in the laboratory, it's a very simple molecule, from, and urea of course is contained in urine, the only living organism, and he made it from ammonium cyanate, which is clearly a non, uh, a substance which is not present in living organisms. By doing so, he did two things which are very important. One is chemistry. He made urea from ammonium cyanate. This was a, a synthesis, a transformation of matter. But the other thing was also very important, and it shows how science can lead to a change on the outlook on the world. At that time, people were thinking that you could not make anything contained in a living organism without the help of a sort of magical force called vital force. By transforming ammonium cyanate into urea, he showed that vital force doesn't exist. There's no magic force like that. Molecules of living systems and molecules of non-living systems, non-living matter, are just molecules of different types, of different complexity. Then, of course, this art and science of making more and more complex uh, constructions from atoms evolved and became very powerful up to now. Uh, for instance, uh, in, the, in the 1970s, up to the possibility of making a very complicated molecule, vitamin B12, which is, of course, much more complicated than urea. This required the common efforts of two groups, one headed by, directed by Robert Woodward at Harvard, the other one by Albert Eschenmoser at ETH in Zurich, and of course, they, had, were, they were not alone, they didn't do it by their own hands. There were about 120, 150 men and women years involved in that. It's a fantastically big molecule, very difficult to set up, because they, for, again, for those who are not chemists, me, making it by what we can call a total synthesis is to take the right carbons, the right hydrogens, the right hydrogens, and to put them in the right position stepwise. This required about 80 different steps to be the, pull it up. Now, I was with, uh, postdoc with Woodward. That is my piece here. That shows not, I don't want to show that it's my piece, but it shows that when you do science, you contribute to an enormous construction, which is science. And all together, you, can, you, are, you become to the building up of science, of a molecule, of a theory, and so on. Molecular chemistry has not stopped at this point. It has developed enormously since then. Many new reactions have been discovered, new materials have been made, new drugs have been synthesized, and a lot of it has been happening, and it's continuing. But then we can say, all right, molecular chemistry is well established. It is continuing its uh, extension, its growth, discovering new materials, as I said, new molecules, new types of reactions, and so on. But maybe there's something else we should worry about. This is a cancer cell, and these are two killer cells. The killer cells are the policemen, police women, in this organism, and they go around and try to find out which cells have become bad cells, cancer cells, and their mission is destroy it. So, how do the killer cells know the other guy is a cancer cell? How? If they make a mistake, you have a problem. Either they do not destroy a cancer cell, or they destroy a healthy cell. So there must be something happening which tells the killer cells that this is a cancer cell. Now, these objects are made of a membrane, which is a molecule made up of molecules, like a soap bubble, to simplify very much. And uh, in this membrane, there are molecules which sort of represent 
the, in that the nature, the, uh, the uh, identity to the, uh, to the identity of the cell itself. So cancer cells express on top of their membrane signals, molecules which signal that this is a cancer cell. And so these ones will find this out by interacting with it. So that is one example. I could have many, many more. This is an example with a white blood cell colored artificially in rose with blue dots, which is HIV virus. When the HIV virus hits uh, the, the cell, the white blood cell, it can infect. What tells the virus? Now I have reached my target, I will infect. There must be something here again which uh, happens between the objects. So there is the idea that there must be a chemistry which deals not with the object itself, but what happens between the objects. In other words, not between just molecules, not just within molecules, but what happens between molecules when they get together, when they assemble, and when they, so to say, feel each other. And so the molecular chemistry, on which everything is, of course, based, develops into what I may call a supramolecular chemistry, which has already been said that it can be defined as a chemistry which lies beyond the molecule, which deals with weak interactions. One can see like glue sort of holding things together in a more or less strong way, but not as strong as what happens in the covalent bonds in molecules. And three main uh, properties have been discussed over the years. Molecular recognition. How do molecules recognize each other? How do they find out who is the partner, what the other one is? how they react with one another, and how they can carry one another through a cell membrane, for instance. Molecular recognition forms the basis of all that. And indeed, there would be no life without molecular recognition. In your body, as you're sitting here, it's quite obvious that all the molecules, they recognize, they sit together, they act on each other, and they, they make things die, live. And uh, so this is the basic process which is present in all living organisms as the basis of life by itself. Now, how can we try to give a simple idea about what molecular recognition is? First of all, you need interaction. Interaction means that there must be some way of the molecules to feel themselves. There's an energy which links them together. That's fine. But there's another property which is very important and which is the one, the most important one, supramolecular chemistry has brought into chemistry, which is information. You cannot recognize without information. So any molecule is, bears information, and this information then can, be, uh, can act on molecules by the contact between them, uh, by this weak interaction binding. But in fact, there was already a person who a long time ago had proposed an image, not on what was called at that time molecular recognition, but an image about the fact that double complementarity, in his case, a complete, sorry, it was a complementarity in geometry. But we can now say that sort of a double complementarity in geometry, the shapes, how it fits together, and interactions, how these things attract or, or repel each other. What is this? Uh, what is, has been said is the following, that Emil Fischer had published a paper in 1894 on the fact that when an enzyme acts on a substrate, they have to fit together in order for this reaction to take place, like Schloss and Schlüssel, like a lock and the key. It's a very it's a simple image. We now know that the lock and the key can adapt to some extent, but basically it's correct. And if one just remembers that, it's already a big step. Here is Emil Fischer. He got the second Nobel Prize in chemistry. He got his doctorate at the university in Strasbourg in 1874. Why? Because at that time, we were part of an empire on the other side of the Rhine. Alsace was German at that time. So Emil Fischer got his PhD there under Adolf von Bayer. And now we hope that we are all Europeans. And uh, nothing like that will happen anymore. That uh, one country conquers another one. 
And then when they win the other part, they throw them out. So I think now we are all Europeans. Now let's look at what is the most fundamental, the most basic recognition process. This is the genome, the storage of the, of the information which makes living organisms. Living organisms on our planet are defined by their genome, their genetic information. This genetic information is constituted by a long string of rather simple chemistry, phosphate and a sugar, ribose. And on this long string are fixed letters, A, chemists have given names, of course, there could have been others, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine, four molecular groups, which are very simple chemical groups. For a chemist, that is much simpler than vitamin B12, for instance. And, of course, two such strands can wrap around each other and form then the famous double helix. But what here is interesting is that the living organisms on our planet are all determined by the sequence of letters. That is why a tomato is not an elephant. Same letters. Why only four? I say, okay, why so simple? Probably the answer is, it's enough. And you will see why it's enough. But before we do that, let's have a look at one of those letters. Adenine. Adenine is one of those letters. For the non-chemists, don't be afraid. I just want to indicate that five molecules of a much smaller type, made of one H, one hydrogen, one carbon, one nitrogen, five of them put together generate adenine. Now, HCN is contained in interstellar space. Adenine then can, in principle, be generated by just putting five of them together, just to show you HCN, HCN, and there's a little bit of rearrangement. But uh, that means that you can see a chemical, rational way of constructing adenine from 5-HCN. You add some water, you get guanine. And some other transformations, you can get cytosine and uracil. And so, uh, again, very simple and linked to the prebiotic evolution of matter. Now, having a sequence of letters for storing information is one thing, but you have then to read it also. And the reading is, again, something very simple. You can, these letters can be paired up in the following way. Adenine can form two interactions represented by these dots with uracil or thymine. This is slight more variation in these two two points of interaction. Guanine can interact with cytosine by three points of interaction. So it's just a binary system, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3. Like in a computer, you have 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. It's 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3. And that's the way one can read the genetic program in the supramolecular way. So the, the information is stored at the molecular level and the reading and processing occurs at the supramolecular level. So chemistry can be considered as an information science, the science of informed matter. All molecules bear, bear information, and the interactions between them is the way this interaction can be processed. This, molecule, this information can be processed. So the question then, let's go back a little bit why this field developed, how we started. Let me just give a justification of why it ended this way. Um, after coming back from postdoc, I wanted to do something very different from either my PhD with natural product chemistry, the synthesis done with Woodward. And so um, we did for a long time theoretical chemistry, quantum chemistry, and things like that, physical organic chemistry, theoretical chemistry. But I was also interested in trying to go again into processes which are interesting for chemists to study because they deal with important biological processes. And here, the initial motivations were linked to neurochemistry, with the idea that the nervous system is 
the highest expression of what we have. That's what makes us different. So can the chemists contribute to this? In the 1960s, of course, uh, it was very difficult to see. But there was a process which might be amenable to chemical studies, at least for a poor, simple chemist. This is the propagation of nerve influx. The propagation of the nerve influx rests on what is called the action potential, where differences, where there are differences in concentration of sodium potassium across a nerve membrane propagate. So sodium potassium differences, they propagate and form this action potential. So when I do this with my arm, this signal is transmitted along the nerve by these changes in sodium and potassium. Now for a chemist, sodium and potassium, that's clear. We know what that is. So the question is, what can one do about understanding the selective binding picking up sodium or potassium and its transport through a nerve membrane to make it make a membrane of the nerve selectively permeable. And this is then uh, where, so to say, one could play a la Emil Fischer by looking at a series of objects which have the same shape but another characteristic, a different size. So it's one column in the Mendeleev table of the elements, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, the alkali metal cations, which are little spheres bearing one positive charge of increasing size. And in this series are these two important ones, sodium and potassium, close to one another. So there must be, in nerve membrane, molecules able to make the distinction between a sodium and a potassium. Otherwise, you have a short circuit. Then one can say, good, what we would like to study is the selective binding and transport of those, in other words, perform spherical molecular recognition. So if one wants to make locks for these spherical keys, one can go to the laboratory and make these objects here, which are, we call them cryptans, are crypts, cavities, which have more or less a spherical shape here. It's quite a nice spherical shape. And you can, by chemical methods, chemical synthesis, make the cavity bigger and bigger and bigger, small, larger, and larger here. And this one is just right for fitting lithium, the smallest one. This one is just right for fitting sodium, and that is right for fitting potassium. So that was an example, and this was our first example and first the start of our work on molecular recognition here of the simplest thing in three-dimensional space is a sphere, spherical recognition. In fact, this work was done by two PhD students, Bernard Dietrich and Jean-Pierre Sauvage, who, as was mentioned, got the Nobel Prize for his own work, totally his own work, in 2016 on molecular machines. Now, of course, this developed a lot, and this question of molecular recognition, many, many, yeah, okay, many, many people contributed to it, but I would like to point out something else, which chemists like also, that chemical objects, molecules, have also some kind of aesthetic features. Here is this, I call it the primordial cryptid. It was the first one we made. And it happens that uh, a chemist in Hungary, Bela Vizi, turned to become an artist, a sculptor, and he made this, which is a rather nice object, which he gave to me. He's at the University of Veszprém on the Balaton Lake, and that is a potassium inside this cryptant here. He has a very keen um, sense of aesthetics of molecules. I show you four more, but I will only discuss one. There are four more here. And let's discuss this one. If you are not a chemist, you see this is like a sort of a scent, sort of fumes that are developing, huh? or vapor, or something like that. And the name of that is the scent of the rose. And it looks like a scent, huh? sort of coming up. And what is it? The chemists in the audience might know that. Roses have a dominant scent. Of course, the roses smell differently. But they have a dominant compound, which is phenyl ethyl alcohol. Phenyl, CH2, CH2OH. 
this photochemist. <laughs> so indeed, it's, it has a it's very nice shape. I have shown these kind of things, and he has also to artists who are not chemists at all. And uh, OK, he has a very nice way of looking at molecules and making some very nice object out of them. Now, this being said, molecular recognition developed enormously. Making locks for keys or keys for locks has been the work for many, many people, many laboratories around the world, many in, in here also. In fact, um, Italy contributed a lot at the beginning on the development, to the development of supramolecular chemistry by organizing meetings. And uh, a lot of work, excellent work, had been done, and also sort of uh, uh, showing that this, the importance uh, of, this, of the field. So many, many studies were done in many laboratories about recognition processes. So let me just quickly summarize this, where we are. Molecular chemistry in 1828 was defined by, the, let's say, we could use the work of Wöhler as the start. One can debate that, but OK. And so making molecules which can bind another one, be a receptor for another one. And then in 1978, I proposed this term supramolecular chemistry, where now the receptor binds to its substrate and forms this supramolecular entity, which then have this three basic properties, how do molecules recognize each other, how can they act on each other, and how can they carry each other through a membrane, for instance, through a barrier, and having then functional systems. Now, let's have a look at some applications which have come out of this work over the last, now about 50, now the start was in the 60s with Peterson also developing the crown ethos. And uh, what has come out in terms of application? Of course, many things. But let me just cite a few where we were mostly involved. First of all, it's quite clear that basic research is necessary to acquire knowledge. And once you have the knowledge, you can apply it. And that leads to applications. The most evident thing, the most evident feature is that drug discovery is the development of biologically active substances which perform specific recognition with a biological target. So it is making keys for biological locks. So understanding molecular recognition is fundamental for drug discovery. We have also been then developing other things like medical diagnostics, gene transfer and biomaterials. Let me quick, quickly mention that. This is a cryptate of another type developed later on where the surrounding shell, the organic shell, has now the property of being able to absorb UV light to transfer this energy to a metal ion, the europium ion in the cavity, which then emits red light. We made, we studied this quite a bit, and we had a very good collaboration here with Vincenzo Balzani and his group in Bologna. They studied the photophysics of this. Uh, of then um, this, you, the use of this, for labeling biomolecules was developed by Dr. Gérard Matisse, and eventually it, this led to the development of a diagnostic apparatus where immunomolecules are, so to say, the sensors, and then this is the bulb the, the one attaches to the sensor to follow it. And this led to, and to the development of this apparatus, crypto, which is used in many hospitals now. The other property is linked to transport, where the idea is that you wish to introduce into a cell a piece of DNA, a gene, so that it goes to the nucleus, gets its uh, RNA, and then generates the resulting protein. What is here important is you can, if I can do it, introduce a DNA into a cell and generate a product that is very important for biotechnology and for gene therapy. One can do that. One way biologists do it by using viruses, but that's something I don't want to get into. And of course, the other way is to make a synthetic vector, because DNA is very water soluble. It doesn't want to go through, um, through a membrane. Uh, a cell membrane is something like a soap bubble. Like it's lip lipidic, so they don't want to get through. So you have to hide these charges and make the thing, uh, even make it able 
to cross the cell membrane. This, of course, is of interest, as I mentioned, for biotechnology and for gene therapy. It is also very basic, and it sort of leads to also the possibility to generate genetically modified organisms. And here I, I usually like to make a strong stand that genetically modified organisms don't bite you. They are extremely useful. We need them, and I'm sure we make them. I know there is a tendency, like in many countries and many groups, to oppose. This is going against the current of science, and I am sure we will use them. I'm sure we will develop them. And nowadays, an apple you eat is not a wild apple. It has been genetically modified by the farmers. OK, they did it by mixing, uh, mixing different type, types of apples, but it's a genetic modification. Of course, people accept more easily to use for gene therapy because it's linked to disease. But it's all the same. It's all the same. Gene therapy is a genetic modification. And biotechnology is another one. And I think now there are a lot of those things where people get afraid. Now that one knows what to do, people get afraid. I don't understand that. Anyway, c'est un combat d'arrière garde, as we see. It's a battle of the ones who are behind in the army. Now, another thing which is also quite interesting is that it takes a long time to have an application. And let me show just one example, which is quite striking. In 1990, we proposed in a paper from my group at the Collège de France at that time to make supramolecular polymers. Polymers were the units are connected through weak non-covalent bonds. And these were transformed into biocompatible polymers by a, a small com company, Xeltis, which developed biocompatible supramolecular polymers so as to make them into, uh, into materials which can be used for the surgical treatment of children which have a congenital cardiac malformation. This was developed in 2013. So it took 23 years to go from the initial proposal of the fact that supramolecular polymers are interesting. And of course, a lot of work has been done, for instance, by Bert Meyer in Holland uh, and uh, several others on developing this field of supramolecular polymers until then it reached a point where one could make something of interest for medical studies and indeed, it was used, and here is the first little girl which has been implanted in 2013, on the 23rd of October 2013. This is three months after implantation. She looks fine, as you can see. The, the surgeon is also very happy. Um, this is um, Leo Bukiaya, who is a professor of, uh, he's a surgeon, a pediatric surgeon, in uh, the Bakulev Center for Cardiovascular Surgery in Moscow. This has now been done for many children. I have here 10, but there are more than 10. And also lately, the company has developed also heart valves, which can be implanted. At the time the slide was made, it was two have been implanted in Budapest and one in Krakow. They tell me that it's for them a breakthrough in surgical practice. Since um, these interactions between molecules are weak, they can also heal. Because if you cleave them, they can reform. And indeed, this is a transparent film made of supramolecular type of interactions where you can cut the film in two, superimpose the two halves, press with your finger just there. We press for a minute or so, just we, not even very strongly. And you can stretch, and it sticks again. So that is then uh, an example of a supramolecular self-healing polymer. And a number of laboratories are, of course, interested in that, and also companies are interested in it. Forget about this. Now, let's go back to the fact that we would like to have, know a little bit more about, uh, the, um, about self-organization on the basis, because I have started with that. So when you understand more about molecular recognition, you can think of using what you learned about molecular recognition and about 
how to make locks for keys and keys for locks, to then let the system self-organize and generate a complex object by selecting, taking the bricks and forming the final object spontaneously, but directed by the way in which the bricks recognize one another. So it's a spontaneous but information controlled process for generating complex objects, molecular objects, supramolecular objects. One example is a biological one. A virus like this one, tobacco mosaic virus, is an entity which is formed from 2,130 protein subunits, bricks. This, uh, this is a brick looked at like a piece of pie. If you look at it more chemically, this is uh, the structure more chemically by structural studies. That is also for the chemist or for the structural biologist. These objects, they got together spontaneously and they build up the core of the virus, the, sorry, the sheath of the virus in which sits then the RNA, which, which is the genome. This looks like magic when you, see, when you look at it, but there is absolutely no magic. All these things happening here are organic chemistry, structural chemistry, physical chemistry, and, the, and thermodynamics and other properties, but there is no magic. It's just the fact that the pieces have the right shape and the right structure to form the assembly spontaneously, but in a very controlled way. So this led to the idea that one can make programmed chemical systems also in the laboratory and uh, trying to build up molecular programs with storing the information in the components and then processing that information through supramolecular interactions. I give you just a, one category of examples. This has been done also in many laboratories, but just to illustrate the point if we take organic molecules as bricks capable of being cemented together by connecting them with metal ions, which are the, is the cement, which links them together, the connections, then one can think of many, many interesting objects. I show you some, a few we have made. Uh, for instance, a double helix and a triple helix. They have nothing to do with DNA, with a natural one, but it was just a sort of a challenge to try to make a double helix and to make a triple helix. And this form simply by taking the molecules represented by the strands and adding the metal ions. Metal ions here, you don't see them because there's copper, there's hidden, there's a little bit, you see, will be here. Here you see them better. A triple helix and these ions are three nickels in that case. But many others can be made. And this is just a grid where the, ion, the metal ions are nicely located at the intersection of molecules, which are vertical and horizontal. You can make also sort of nano cylinders. This is an interesting case because there are three linear molecules, four flat ones, and 12 connectors. So 19 components go together spontaneously and generate this object. Of course, you can imagine many others, just nice shapes, and many others have been made uh, by uh, many chemists around the world, many, many, many papers on this kind of handling the build-up of, uh, of complex supramolecular entities by designing the brick and using the right connectors. It is also of interest for nanoscience and nanotechnology because after all, now we know that we have very powerful methods of uh, making um, devices like computers in a very, in a very powerful way. But you may also say, OK, that's a fabrication approach. Can, could there be a self-organization approach where the device builds itself up from its components? In other words, can one go from fabrication, the need to make, to self-fabrication, let the object make itself? In principle, it should be possible to generate in stepwise more and more complex entities which then build up by self-organization. In fact, an easy way to convince you is sort of it's always it's very trivial. Is that the most, for the moment still, the most powerful computer we have is the one between our two ears. That one is self-organized. It doesn't make it. It just makes itself. It just shows that it's an inbuilt property of matter. 
So, just a little bit, I have added a few, not many, just a few slides for the chemists who will be around, just to tell them what we are now up to, what we are now trying to develop. Self-organization by design is what I just showed you, making molecules capable of getting together with given interactions, which can be metal ions, but also other type of interactions, and then generating a final object, also like the DNA double helix. There you have information in the pieces. The program is the way in which these things get together and recognize each other, and you design it. And you hope to be able to design a system which will generate a given output. But then is another step which is uh, interesting to look at, which is can we do that with selection? In other words, if we have a mixture of a number of many bricks, can one set up a system where, by adding something, these bricks will select, or by doing something to the system, it will select what it needs to beat itself up, select some of those bricks to build, build up a given final entity. That requires diversity in different types of uh, organic molecules, of bricks, and also dynamics, because you don't want a thing to hit, to collide, and then to be stuck. Because if, it co if the collision doesn't get the right result, the, the thermodynamically most stable one, then you have to be able to explore, to, to dissociate, and to start all over again, just to look at the other combinations. That opens the possibility to adaptation, because if this happens by dissociation and reassociation, if you change the conditions, maybe the system will adapt, and then one can think of building up a chemistry which I may call an adaptive chemistry. Let me just quickly illustrate this a little. Uh, I'm sorry, this is now more for the chemists, but uh, I will come back to more general considerations in a moment. So, very quickly, because interactions with molecules are weak, supermolecular entities are labile. They can do this. Bind, dissociate, bind, dissociate. As a consequence, you will have here a dynamic chemistry where the objects can break apart and reform and break apart. You can also transfer that to molecular chemistry by introducing bonds which can break in a molecule. Bonds which can break, reform, break, reform. So in both cases, you have this possibility that the constitution of your chemical object can dissociate, can fall apart, and reform, but maybe differently, by incorporating certain new pieces or expelling some others. And this is this a chemistry where the constitution of the chemical object is not static anymore, but can modify, can be modified by the um, by the agents in the surroundings, and that is then leads to a possibility of having adaptation. Um, what is it good for? Very briefly, it generates a big set of combinations. And then, if you have this big set of combinations, this diverse set, you can perform a selection on this diversity. It, one can apply it, it has been applied, to searching for biologically active substances, having dynamic nanostructures, where the nanostructure will modify itself depending on what you do to it and also dynamic materials. What is interesting here, in more general terms, is that the diversity results from a recombination of pieces. Uh, so the combinatorics is the one which generates diversity. The recognition is the what drives the system for having selective bindings together. This is sort of, let's say, information. So you combine the power of diversity, generate many, many, many objects, uh, with the power of having recognition of chemical information. Let me just illustrate that by uh, one thing which gives you perhaps, I hope, an idea about it. Suppose you have chemical entities which have all kinds of shapes and structures. And you have here a point here which can lead to reversible connections between these. So you can then generate all possible combinations. This set gives access to all possible combinations. Now, okay, you have a mess, you have a mixture, you have a, 
uh, soup of entities. So what can you do with that? You can simply apply a very basic law of thermodynamics that when you add the receptor, having this binding site here, it will pick up from these possible combinations the one which fits best. That's the one which will give the most stable combination. So if this is considered as a lock, it assembles its key. You don't have to make the key, the lock. That's the job. Of course, it's not a panacea. One has to discuss in details uh, different cases, like statistics and so on. But I just wanted to illustrate the way in which this selection on a diversity of objects can lead to a system which will spontaneously select what's the best for the binding and just following, therefore, thermodynamics. This is dynamic search for the best binder, and that's, of course, a method for drug discovery, which has been applied to many things like enzyme inhibitors and also synthetic or biological synthetic receptors. Um, I would just like to show you one thing also, how this can be applied to materials. Suppose you have polymers, polymeric films. I, I just summarize a bit here. If you have a film made up of two units, AB, 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 another one having made up of A prime, which is an analog of A, but somewhat different, B prime also, A prime, B prime, A prime, B prime. If you simply impose these two films, and if these connections can break and reform, it can, in principle, generate the two combinations which are not yet present. A can combine with B prime, and A prime can combine with B. So from this AB, AB, and A prime, B prime, A prime, B prime films, you can make, by recombination, two new combinations. And if one of those has a property which does not exist at the start, you will see it. And I just illustrate that to you by one example. Uh, this was work done with a Japanese company, Mitsui Chemicals. They were sending co-workers to my group in Strasbourg. We were developing the basic chemistry, and they were interested in possible applications. This is AB. That's A prime, B prime. You superimpose it by a corner, for instance. Of course, when it's superimposed, you can generate A, connect A with B prime, and A prime with B. Is that, if one of these two combinations has a color, or a fluorescence, you will see it. So they made this uh, nice illustration. We have a, the head of a cat. The head and the ear is AB, the ears, AB. Inside of the ears, eyes and moustache, A prime, B prime. And color, fluorescence, only where it's superimposed, showing that we know, of course, that one of those two combinations had a color and was fluorescent. But it shows that, indeed, you can generate then new properties through due, due to the fact that this, these things, these bondings are, are uh, dynamic, can break, and reform in a different way. So this opens interesting fields. OK, um, yeah, maybe for those uh, who are more, yeah, in, more on the physical side, there's something interesting there which I would just like to point out, because I, I find it's very important. If we play the game I just said, you have A, A prime, B, P prime, which can connect, react, to generate A, B, A, B prime, A prime, B, and A prime, B prime. That is a simple network. What network? This can be simply represented by a square. Four corners, four constituents. Now, if you look at the edges of the square, the edges they link constituents which share a component. AB has A in common with AB prime and B in common with A prime B. Okay? So if AB, for some reason, in this dynamic exchanging mixture, increases for some reason, it's obvious that A prime B and AB prime must decrease. Because if AB increases, it eats up this A and this B. Okay? So these are antagonists. When one goes up, the other ones must go down. But the most interesting, this is quite sort of obvious, 
But the most interesting is what is on the diagonals. AB does not share a component with A prime B prime. If AB increases, it liberates A prime and B prime, which can make A prime B prime. Okay? Which means that if AB increases, A prime B, A prime, B prime must increase. They are agonists. If this goes up, this goes up, obviously, because of the connections between them. So that is quite interesting. Uh, and let me just summarize the concept there. No, no molecules, nothing. Just sticking with the concept. A very important property here is what I call agonist amplification. When AB increases, its agonist, A prime, B prime, must increase. In biological terms, in development, this means also that the fittest for something also amplifies the unfittest because they don't compete. And there's some interesting things there about uh, bi developmental biology. I haven't time to get into it, but I just wanted to uh, show you and uh, perhaps some people in the audience interested in uh, networks uh, can see here that uh, one can build up networks and look at what happens so that when you touch one point in the network, all the others will know about. Because that point will talk, tell the others, I have increased, so the other ones have to adapt. And that is something we have now more complex ones than that, but I want to just illustrate it. So let me summarize with the view of chemistry. Chemistry, we start with molecular. We have to learn how to make molecules. This is now a very powerful field. Supermolecular chemistry has enormously developed in the last 50 years. Then how to make organized systems, self-organized systems. Then the dynamicity, building in the dynamicity where pieces can exchange from one entity to another one. And then the adaptivity. Of course, that is a progressive steps to a more and more complex states of matter. I hope to have shown you one very important thing for a chemist, that the essence of chemistry is to create expressions of matter which did not exist before they were made in the laboratory. So the book of chemistry must be written, not only read. Of course, we have to read the book of what has already been uh, developed by evolution. Trees, human beings, and so on. But there are many things we can make which do not exist before they have been made. In the same way, the score of chemistry has to be composed, not only played. So one can, again, represent this creative power of chemistry by a piece of art, which is this famous sculpture, again, of Auguste Rodin, where you see the hand of the artist expressing out of the stone a sculpture which was not in the stone. The stone is not, has nothing. The stone is a stone. But it's the hand of the artist which, fasc which shapes this uh, piece of art and so one can also say that chemistry is, in some ways, the art of matter. Having this possibility to generate many new objects, to create entities which did not exist, this has been sensed a long time ago by another famous Italian. They come up all the time, these people. Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, he was an engineer, a scientist, and an artist. He wrote a fantastic sentence, which is shown here. You read it in Italian. It's easier for you. <laughs> but let me do it in English to insist on certain things. Where nature finishes to produce its own species. Of course, we are part of that. Man begins using natural things. The periodic table of the elements. These are the elements around us. In harmony with his very nature, the laws of physics. You cannot go against huh? the laws of physics. That's the way it is. But then comes the ending, which is fantastic, to create an infinity of species. I'm surprised that he wasn't bound for that. This is something to make him bound. No? Barbecue. <laughs> no, it's imp incredible. So, coming back to this country I already mentioned, there were gods there, and they had the fire of knowledge. And Prometheus stole it and gave it to mankind. Here you see him running away, looking over his shoulder to see if the other guys don't run after him to catch him before he's able to give it to mankind. 
he was able to give it to mankind. So we have it. And we cannot give it back. That's the fire of science, the fire of knowledge. But you cannot give it back. What you know, you know. You cannot just take an eraser and say, oh, I erase it. I don't want to know that. You cannot. You know it. And so we have to live with it. It also means that we will go the way from looking for knowledge, the quest of knowledge, to controlling our own destiny. Evolution has shaped us. We will be able to shape us. There are a lot of questions behind that. But we are able, and, if, and we know that we will be able, and we closely are able. So, where did science start? There's uh, famous paintings all over the Middle Ages that had eight and Eve, all types. I've learned in pictures of that. But the interesting thing is, what is she doing? What is she doing, really? Something terrible, isn't it? Picking the fruit, the forbidden fruit, of the tree of knowledge. That's the birth of science. It's a bit provocative, but I'm convinced of that. That was the first scientific gesture. So this knowledge was transferred in the past in this way. <laughs> Presently, in this way. Again, an Italian here. Huh? I guess you know that. I, haven't, I don't need to tell you who it is. And what is it in the future? Yeah, this is not just a joke. I don't mean that robots will be the people we give a hand to, but that we will transform ourselves. And um, in the audience, there may be people who have new lenses in their eyes. That's not a natural lens. That's a polymer. You may have other teeth. That's, again, a polymer. You may have some titanium in your hip. Or if you have undergone heart transplantation, you cannot tell your wife, I give you my heart. It's not yours. <laughs> so we have to realize we are just plumbing, a lot of plumbing, a lot of organs, pieces, organoids. But the important thing is that uh, we have this ability to think about it, to transform and take now our destiny in our own hands. Let me just remind you, for those who don't know, I tell them that the Nobel Prize for Stem Cells to Yamanaka and Gordon, Yamanaka was able to make a mouse from a skin cell of a mouse. All the information is in the skin cell. All you have to do is to deprogram it and to make it again a cell which can generate an organism. And these kind of things have been, been done many years ago already. There's a, there's a German Spiemann who worked on salamanders. OK, I haven't time to get into all that, but where he showed that you can make different organs. So let me, I haven't said much about mathematics. I must say something, because there are some people here who are interested in mathematics, obviously. So that nice-looking person, deeply looking, deep, deep look, is a famous mathematician. David Hilbert. He's buried in Göttingen. And here is an uh, inscription on his tombstone. What does this, what is, uh, there are two sentences. What are these two sentences? We müssen wissen, we must know. That's a good start. But the ending is even better. We werden wissen, we will know. Now, that's a very strong statement, of course. But it's sort of it's the one which drives us as scientists. Huh? We must know. OK, fine. But you will know. And that is what drives us. So from the tree of knowledge to science, we will know. And the sentence I usually like, it has been cited already, science shapes the future of humanity. Participate. Let me close by a sort of a political statement. That's it. Science has no borders, and we have to stick together. Thank you very much. <laughs>